Any case, I'm here to talk about uh, um, Cassandra running on Kubernetes and multi-cloud Kubernetes. So a lot of different topics coming together. Um, has a little bit of a story because it started at KubeCon EU actually in LA about uh, a year back, October, when I did a multi-cloud or a multi-region actually, Cassandra on GKE because GKE networking is probably the easiest among all the other clouds, right? Uh, but fast forward, you know, through reInvent and KubeCon EU and all that, um, now I'm in a position where I've been able to install a multi-cloud Cassandra, and you'll see that in action today, in a lot of demos today, okay? A multi-cloud Cassandra running on GKE and EKS, which is installed from AKS, okay? So, so I think it's pretty cool, you'll see that. Um, it, it took me a few months uh, to actually make that happen. Uh, and I think it'll be even more exciting now that uh, Satya Nadella and Larry Ellison are talking about multi-cloud, right? You know? <laughs> so everybody is talking about multi-cloud. But my question to the audience is, how many of you are already doing multi-cloud? A few people. And I know multi-cloud has different connotations, right? Um, you know, if I use different clouds, it means, it could mean multi-cloud. But in this context, it really means my application is spread across different clouds. So with this new definition where my application is running on multiple clouds at the same time, how many of you are doing multi-cloud? Few, okay. And, and all of you, I mean, I, I assume that three of you are using Kubernetes or something else or uh, kind of, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so let's talk about this, and, and, and we'll see, um, you know, where it takes us, okay? Um, oh, by the way, um, my name is Raghavan Srinivas. I work as a developer advocate for data stacks. Um, you know, I was a mechanical engineer, uh, but since then I've done a lot of distributed systems, middleware. Some of the things I like to see is code in action, and that's why I'm going to do a lot of demos today. Um, and... I have a colleague of mine, uh, Matt Overstreet, who's much smarter than me, so I'll, you know, <laughs> delegate all questions to him, right? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, again, feel free to talk to us if you have any questions about Cassandra. He did a great talk. I recommend you kind of go take a look at that as well, um, you know, where he talked more from an application patterns perspective. Uh, rather than from any infrastructure perspective. Uh, I myself, I live at kind of the confluence of both infrastructure and applications. I just want things to work. I come from a Cloud Foundry background. Um, you know, I, I, I just want things to work. You know, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of the famous CF push and everything is stood up. I don't know, you know, anything about, you know, where it is, uh, um, you know, where it is deployed, how it is deployed. What are the you know, things that make it happen? It just happens, right? Um, so I'm also a big fan of kind of the inner loop. Inner loop is when you have a kind of a lightweight CI CD cycle. Uh, and you know, uh, some of you used uh, scaffold, jib, and kind of those tools. It makes it a lot easier for, for somebody who's an application developer on Kubernetes to be able to do this you know, mundane tasks over and over again, like maybe 100, 200 times a day. Um, with that said, how many of you were able to attend uh, Cat Cosgrove's talk this morning about Kubernetes? Yeah, that was a great talk as well. Uh, so I recommend, you know, if you're new to Kubernetes, how many of you are new to Kubernetes? I mean, like, really new, okay. Okay, that's about half. Uh, that's kind of what I expected as well. Uh, I'd, I'd strongly recommend you, you attend that, uh, I mean, uh, not attend the talk because it's already done, but, but you know, um, um, take a look at look at it, or if you have a chance, you know, kind of see her at at some point. Uh, we have a great crew behind us. Um, we do workshops every week. Uh, they're all free to attend. Um, we have a a, uh, a tier which makes it possible for you to actually run some fairly sophisticated production workloads, and you get a twenty-five dollar per credit. I mean, ten twenty-five dollars per month credit without even having to put any credit card or anything like that. The main goal of our data stacks developer crew is to up-level, you know, your, your uh, 
learning or your experience or whatever the case may be. And I myself learn a lot in those workshops. It happens every, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, uh, 11 Eastern, I need to be specific about that, uh, which is a little bit early for Pacific, but we try to get here to a world, uh, worldwide audience. We get about, you know, anywhere between 200 to 800 people. So feel free to attend that uh, if you want some more basic information because today I'm going to be going into a little bit more advanced topics, okay? Um, but even though I'm going to be doing a lot of advanced topics, and by the way, I've been um, criticized for being a little too loud, okay? <laughs> Which you can see, it comes from excitement, okay? <laughs> so, so if I'm too loud, you know, just let me know. I will pipe it down, okay? I'll try to anyway. Um, so, um, so the agenda for today is just do a quick intro um, which I already did, right? Uh, and then, um, for those of you who have never heard of NoSQL or Cassandra, a very quick intro of NoSQL and Cassandra, and then a little bit about Kate Sandra, which is a play on Cassandra and Kubernetes names, right? And I, I think it's a pretty cool name. Uh, it's Q uh, Cassandra running on Kubernetes. And then, of course, the multi-cluster, multi-cloud, uh, using the Kate Sandra operator, which is introduced very recently. So when I started my GKE adventure, um, there was nothing as a Kate Sandra operator. Um, there really wasn't. So I had to do things manually. Uh, but now I don't need to anymore, and I'll show you how you can do that. Um, you know, um, it, it uses, and, and maybe I'm giving away everything right now, uh, but basically what Cassandra does is uses something called as a gossip protocol. And as long as one node from a Cassandra perspective can talk to another node, you enable the networking to make it happen, then essentially it can form a larger cluster on its own. And that is all that I'm gonna show today, okay? Basically, it doesn't matter whether it's multi-region, multi, um, you know, sorry, multi-cluster, multi-region, or multi-cloud, it works exactly the same. And the gossip protocol is pretty cool because what it's saying is it's just not kind of like a heartbeat kind of thing. It, it actually exchanges more information uh, to the level that, you know, each node has an idea of what the other node is doing at any point in time and not too much information. It's not too chatty, but at the same time, it's not really basic information. And as long as you enable the networking, you can make it happen. And you will see one or two instances of that. I won't go into my first adventure, which is with GKE, but I'll go into EKS, where I used something called as EKS CubeFed. Unfortunately, CubeFed is not, anybody using CubeFed anyway? I'd like to talk to, yeah, I, I don't see any hands at all, unfortunately. But EKS CubeFed is a great project, and I'll talk about that. Uh, and then I'll do some demos, and then finally, uh, kind of point you at some resources, and hopefully we can get out of here, um, you know, much before, uh, half past five, okay? All right, so no big deal, no sequel was a, you know, somebody came up with this catchy hashtag, uh, but I was corrected uh, that um, somebody actually had invented this term, but, you know, I think it got popularized a little bit more um, by this meetup on July, June 11th, 2009, roughly 13 years ago, okay? Um, so, so really, if you think about Cassandra, no SQL and all that, it's not fundamentally new. It definitely isn't. But, you know, if you think about the cloud and, you know, no SQL, there are a lot of um, commonalities, okay? Uh, one of the biggest things about no SQL is that it's really about horizontal scaling. Commodity hardware, you know, cheap hardware, but tons and tons of them, so that even if failure happens, which is going to happen in distributed systems, you can still deal with it. Uh, by having a replication of the data, and you don't need to worry about any of that as a developer. It's all automatically taken care of for you. That is, in general, the philosophy of NoSQL. Of course, each of the different platforms vary a little bit, uh, but, but we will look at all of this uh, in just a second. There are a lot of examples, Cassandra, Mongo, Couch, HBase, Couchbase, you know, and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, but in general, what, what it is, is about horizontal scaling. It's, you know, because with a relational database, you know, you can go up and up and up and up. At some point, you know, it's going to, you know, keel over and fall, right? Um, and, and really, 
there are ways in which you can do, um, you can spread your data on, on a relational database, but, but it's very clumsy, very awkward, and a lot of times you have to do it manually, and it's never foolproof, right? Uh, whereas NoSQL, on the other hand, was really conceived with the idea that, you know, distributed systems failure is going to happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spread the data across. I will worry about how to spread the data across. I might use some kind of consistent hashing algorithm. Don't worry about it. I, I got it for you, right? And, and what happens when some piece of data that you're trying to access actually is not you know, available at that point. You know, those are the things that the NoSQL database is going to deal with. Okay, it's really deal, um, meant, it's, it was really meant for the cloud even before there was a cloud. <laughs> you know, that's kind of how I put it, okay? Um, some of you might have heard of this famous CAP theorem, or sometimes referred to as the Brewer's Conjecture. Um, you know, but essentially what it says is, in the event of everything running fine, Everything is fine, okay? So in other words, I can have consistency, I can have availability, and I can have partition tolerance, and I can, uh, well, you know, failure means even partition tolerance. But, but in, in essence, when a failure happens, you have to pick two of the three, okay? Unfortunately, you have to give up one of these, right? And that's, that's the way the distributed systems work. Okay, so either you have to give up consistency, or you have to give up availability, or you have to give up partition tolerance, right? So, so you can't have all three at the same time. And turns out, partition, giving up on partition tolerance uh, is probably worse than giving up on consistency, because those kind of consistency issues, even my grandmother can notice that, you know, that's a problem, right? On the other hand, in consistency, there is this concept of eventual consistency where, where things might seem to be off a little bit, but it's really not a big deal because, you know, eventually they'll become consistent, right? And turns out even for some of the um, uh, fairly sophisticated distributed applications, eventual consistency might be good enough, okay? Um, but you really don't want to sacrifice on partition tolerance, uh, tolerance and, and we'll see where Cassandra fits in. Obviously, partition tolerance is extremely important, um, but we are an AP system. Um, and as you can see here, most NoSQL systems um, do not give up on partition tolerance. They may give up on availability or consistency, right? Uh, and really, it's not uh, like it's eventual consistency, uh, consistent either, right? Uh, you can actually make it what we call as tunable consistency, and some people don't, may not like that term. But essentially, what you can do is you can say, I want strong consistency, but now the system will not be available at that point. Because if I want a, a uh, acknowledgement from all of the different replicas, right, uh, then, then typically what will happen is, um, you know, the system will not be available because it may not be able to, um, you know, take care of that particular transaction or that particular write. One of the key things about Cassandra is that there is no single point of failure and there is really no such thing as a master. Um, basically, you can call it a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, if you will. You know, a lot of, a lot of times, you know, uh, a lot of times you might have seen the ring associated with Cassandra and essentially every node is kind of treated the same, okay? And, and all of these, you know, is important to keep in mind when you're building this multi-cluster Cassandra because it makes it so much easier, um, you know, to build a multi-cluster uh, given this architecture. And, and in a lot of ways, you know, remember again what, you know, Kelsey Hightower said, you know, Kubernetes is really not a platform, it's a platform to build platforms, right? Um, so, so likewise, um, you know, it, the multi-cluster concept really depends on the application or the platform that you're building on top of Kubernetes and whether you can take advantage of it or not. Uh, in, the, in the case of Cassandra, actually, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, why do you need to partition? Because, you know, you can't fit all the world's data in one node, right? So you distribute it to multiple nodes and you shard the data. But sharding is hard, right? And that's why, you know, the NoSQL platforms shine uh, because a lot of times, um, you, you as an application developer don't need to worry about any of this, right? Um, 
there were there were some NoSQL systems, at least in the early days, where you had to worry about the sharding. Uh, but really, you know, friends don't want friends to shard. It's hard. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Cassandra, like I said, is configurably, uh, configurably consistent, which is probably a more palatable term than tunable consistent, right? Uh, so, you know, there is a number of ways you can do this. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, like I said, you can, you can make sure that you get consistency all, in which case everybody has to reply and so on. Um, this is not so much about kind of putting in logos and, and a marketing uh, slide or whatever, uh, but the point to be made here is that, you know, some of these large, large, large scale, um, you know, thousands of nodes of Cassandra uh, are running as we speak, you know, in some of these uh, bigger companies like Netflix, Apple, and so on. Apple is still a contributor to Cassandra, um, you know, and uh, really, you know, it's really about scale, and one of the things that Cassandra shines is linear scalability. You know, there was a study done uh, when you went from 100 to 1,000 to, you know, 10,000, whatever, and it was just, you know, linear. No fall off, there is no, you know, uh, drop off at any point of time, which is, which is very, you know, um, hard to do, um, you know, even, even in a horizontally scalable system, right? So, uh, you know, what about Kate Sandra? Kate Sandra is Cassandra running on Kubernetes, right? Um, and, and, you know, a uh, colleague of mine, Chris Bradford, a great guy, again, um, was a former skeptic of, uh, of uh, running any database, as a matter of fact, on Kubernetes. And, and it was probably true in the early days of Kubernetes because, you know, um, there are a lot of, uh, lot of things which, which wasn't quite, um, you know, production quality or whatever you want to put it, right? And, uh, you know, there was the, it, it, there, were, there are a couple of things that even, you know, with Cassandra, it's not easy to do. Um, but, but long story short, um, you know, Chris Bradford now actually works for, for Datastax. Okay, and he's, he's a big proponent of Kate Sandra. Um, and and you'll, you'll see this uh, in action today, okay? So what is Kate Sandra? Again, it's a cloud native scalable data tier. Um, as uh, you know, Matt talked in his uh, talk yesterday, basically, you know, it's not just about providing the day zero tools, but also providing day one tools like backup restore, being able to repair nodes, um, you know, being able to get some uh, um, metrics like Prometheus, Grafana, and so on. Um, maybe able to do ingress, you know, using traffic or Nginx and so on. All of these are provided in a easy to install and easy to manage and easy to administer. Okay? So as you may expect, what is the installation? You add the repo, you know, Helm repo, add Kate Sandra and, and just provide the repo, right? You update and then you install and that's it. As simple as this, right? Uh, you can tweak some values, very, uh, very straightforward, right? You know, you can, you can say, well, I want Reaper, I don't want Stargate. Stargate is a unified API, and you'll see that in a second. Um, so you can, you, can, you can pick and choose the components that you want. You can say, well, uh, you know, in a case of a multi-cluster install or a multi-availability um, um, multi zone install, right? You can, you can say, I want my data centers to be uh, rack aware and I want it to be spread on different racks and provide a higher level of availability. So even if a particular rack goes down, right, uh, you, sh you shouldn't have a problem. Uh, and then of course, you know, you can go further up from there and do a multi-region or a multi-cluster or a multi-cloud as well, okay? Um, but, but the philosophy is generally the same, okay? You can install it on Pretty much anything. I've, I think I've done on pretty much everything, right? Um, you know, I, I do have Kind, I do have Minikube, I do have Sivo, I do have GKE, I do have AKS, and I do have e, you know, EKS as well. Uh, really, I mean, you can, you can install Kate Sandra on pretty much anything you want, okay? Uh, it's very cool because, you know, if I want to do some local development, you know, I do mostly on Minikube or Kind, right? Uh, mostly on Kind. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I basically try everything out and then finally deploy it on GKE or whatever. So, you know, pretty straightforward. In fact, our Kate Sandra operator, um, our docs actually talk about installing and kind cluster. Uh, and then you can kind of extrapolate it and, and do it on uh, multiple regions, multiple cloud, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, by the way, does anybody have a Kate Sandra installed? One. <laughs> I hope you did. <laughs> he, has, he has a thousand node cluster, which he'll be glad to talk about. Um, yeah. Um, so, Kate Sandra comes with a bunch of components. Um, obviously, Cassandra at the heart of everything, right? Uh, and then we have a unified API called Stargate. Okay, with Stargate, you can do, as an application developer, really cool, because you can do document API if you want, you can use SQL if you want. SQL is our Cassandra query language. It's kind of similar to SQL, but, but it's a little different, right? Uh, and then, of course, uh, you can do gRPC or GraphQL as well. Okay, it's a unified API, uh, which is, again, very, very cool. Uh, and then we have two components called C uh, Cassandra and Repair, um, Reaper, uh, you know, which basically does the repair, and then, of course, Prometheus and Grafana. All of these are installed as Helm charts. Okay, all that I do I, is I install the CAS operator, uh, and then, you know, all of these are automatically installed for me. You can see here, I install the CAS operator, and then I get a REST or document API endpoint plus Swagger plus GraphQL endpoint. I get a repair UI. Uh, I get a SQL endpoint. I get traffic. All of these, you know, um, very easy to install. Okay. And we have some sessions from uh, from KubeCon. Um, you know, if you're in, uh, interested in install, uh, you can you can kind of walk through that. But but the Kate Center at I/O, and I'll point you at that, uh, has wonderful docs. And, and all that I do is, you know, kind of refer to that. So, that was a lot of introduction about Cassandra and Case Cassandra without even getting into the multi-cloud aspect of it, right? So, let's get to the multi-cluster and the multi-cloud. Uh, the reason this was born was because we kind of started hitting some limits with Helm. Can you bend and make Helm work? Uh, probably. But it's just not, you know, it, it just wasn't right to do it that way. Uh, so we went ahead and built another operator called the Kubernetes operator. And there's a great discussion by uh, Jeff Carpenter and John Sanda, who is basically our tech lead for Kate Sandra. And they walk you through this, you know, if you have some time, it's just a discussion, you know, it talks about why Helm, uh, what are the limits that we hit with Helm. Why a new operator? What is an operator? Um, you know, because for some time, you know, the Kubernetes community kind of were looking down on Kubernetes operators in general because there was, you know, a lot of like perception issues associated with it. But now I, it looks like you know the Kubernetes operator has come back in style again, right? You know, it's it's still pretty relevant to be able to do that because it's really all about you know, kind of the same Kubernetes concepts that you talk about. You know, it's really about self-healing. It's really about being, uh, being able to watch what's happening and taking appropriate action based on that, whether it's corrective action or whether it's some other action, uh, you can do all that. So, so if you have some time, you know, take a look at this, why we pushed Helm to the limit and then built a Kubernetes operator. It's a four part, so you will get all details about that. So why multi-cluster? Um, Cassandra has always been designed for multi-region. You know, we, we you know we thought about multi-region right from the beginning, um, and and each node in the cluster maintains the full topology. It talks to the other node via gossip protocol and all that. You know, uh, so it routes the traffic to the other neighbors. It has an idea of what the neighbors are doing um, because it's it's talking to each other and all those good things, right? Uh, so in a way, it seems like you know each cluster understands the other. Kubernetes, on the other hand, was not designed for multi-region. And a and lot of those goes back, you know, to kind of the networking design that was made um, where, you know, you kind of assume that each pod is able to talk to another pod, right? And more so, they all need to be in kind of a flat network, right? Uh, so it becomes a little hard to kind of be able to do that. 
and, and actually for my multi-cloud, um, you know, there are a number of ways of achieving multi-cloud for sure, right? Uh, what I did was I used something called as a, uh, um, you know, something called as Aviatrix. I don't know if any of you have used Aviatrix or aware of it. Uh, I, I'm not getting paid by Aviatrix. I just liked it and I have actually submitted a proposal for KubeCon North America to be able to build a multi-cluster to actually do this in action in 90 minutes, okay? Uh, what I'm gonna show off uh, in a little bit, okay. So, the Kate Center operator is really designed to make it very easy to kind of do this multi-region, multi-cloud, uh, I'm missing, always missing something, right? It's either multi-region, multi multi-cluster, or multi-cloud, okay? It doesn't really matter. Kate Center operator will handle that, okay? I mean, if you're not doing multi also, it'll still do that, uh, but, but really, Kate Center operator does, uh, has a lot of advantages. Um, the CAS operator, on the other hand, is great for a single cluster, right? Um, from a Kubernetes perspective, right? Um, but, but the moment you get into a multi-cluster scenario, um, the Kate Center operator has this concept of what is referred to as a control plane, and it's able to take care of the data planes, uh, you know, kind of similar to how, you know, many of the Kubernetes services operate. It's support for multi-data center, uh, multi-region Cassandra clusters. It consists of a control plane and data plane, right? Um, and the control plane creates and manages the objects, uh, again, using API, right? The control plane right now, unfortunately, can only be installed in a single cluster, so it's not highly available, which is, you know, coming, but it's not there yet. Um, do we know when it's coming or no? Okay. Uh, and the data plane can be installed in any number of clusters. You know, uh, in this case, what I've done is I've used AKS as my control plane, and I've installed the uh, two clusters on EKS, and uh, the other one is GKE, okay? And you'll see that in action today. So how does that actually, how does this magic really work? The magic of this is that basically what happens is there's a little bit of a chicken and egg, right, where the control plane needs to understand the data plane, right? And, and so what you do is you inject the configuration of the respective data planes into the control plane, okay? So there is a way to inject the, uh, the configuration, and once you know the configuration, then, then, you know, things become a lot easier from an installation perspective. And then, of course, once you install Cassandra, you really don't need to do anything because they know the other um, nodes. They're able to talk to them and gossip around and build a bigger cluster, okay? So here's an example of a Kate Sandra cluster object that is used to, you know, uh, basically build a multi-region um, uh, Cassandra cluster. You can see here there are um, actually two configs that I'm using are two Kubernetes contexts. One is east and the other is west, okay? So essentially what I'm saying here is my data plane is going to be an east and my other data plane is going to be an west and this is the context that you need to use, okay? And you will see all of this again, you know, when, when, I, when I kind of dissect my installation, okay? So essentially, what I, there are two contexts that are injected into the control plane. One is called east, the other is called west. And once it has the Kubernetes context associate, associated with it, it's, it's able to go install Cassandra there. And then, of course, by the way, by the nature in which Cassandra operates, it's able to build a big, uh, bigger cluster. And this kind of shows the same thing as well. Um, and this is kind of how the client config looks, um, but, but we don't need to worry too much about this, okay? And what we'll do is we'll jump straight into the demo. So remember my, my journey, right? My travail started with GKE, where I set up, you know, the multi-region Cassandra. Very easy to do because, you know, networking in GKE is a lot easier. You know, it has, uh, um, you know, addresses reserved for pods and addresses reserved for services. And all that I needed to do was take the address from the seed service from one 
and inject it into the other, and then it found a big cluster, Kumbaya, you know, it's all done, right? But I'll skip that demo, but I'll skip to the next demo, which is this, this is the EKS demo. Okay, and hopefully you guys can see it in the back, kinda, otherwise I'll explain it. Um, essentially what EKS CubeFed does, and it's a fantastic project, really. If you, if you have not used it before, I really, you know, it, it, it provided me with exactly what I wanted. What I wanted was, I knew I was gonna make mistakes. I knew I was gonna stumble. So what I did was, I wanted something that was repeatable, right? Um, and, and at that point, there was no Kate Sandra operator. I had to inject the seeds myself and do a whole bunch of manual stuff, right? So I was lucky to find this EKS project, okay, EKS CubeFed, which is actually maintained by, uh, by uh, Amazon. Uh, but, but like I said, you know, the whole CubeFed thing is kind of falling out of um, favor. But what EKS CubeFed does is it provides me with, you know, these two VPCs. As you can see here, in this particular example, you have 172.21 running on region two and 172.22 running on central in, uh, I believe it's in the EU central one. And the other one is the EU west one. So Frankfurt, right, is running 172.21. And uh, I believe it's Dublin. Uh, which is uh, EU, sorry, EU West is uh, Dublin and EU Central is Frankfurt, whatever, okay? And we'll see all that in, 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 a, in a second. Uh, and it provides me with a bastion host. Uh, a bastion host is a way in which I can connect to these respective hosts if I want to, right? So the bastion host is installed for me. It's on 172 at 20. Okay, it's all opinionated, but, but that's fine for me because it works and I'm not a networking geek by any means, I just wanted to make it work, right? So I had a 172 at 20, 172 at 21, 172 at 22, and then what I did was I installed uh, Cassandra on 172.21 and injected the seeds into 22, exactly the same thing, and, and they formed a bigger cluster and, you know, good to go, okay? And you'll see this in action. But, with the, with the uh, introduction of the Kate Sandra operator, I don't have to do any of that, right? Because it, in principle, does the same thing, right? You know, it knows the seeds and essentially is able to, you know, do the gossip protocol and make it work, okay? So that's exactly what the Kate Sandra operator does and we'll see that in action as well. Okay, so this is, uh, hmm, I don't want to, basically it talks about all of these different components and what are the different contexts and so on. Uh, but but let's keep all that, okay? So I don't know why this this came in here. I need to get rid of this. But let's let's go let's go into the demo. Let's let me not worry too much about this. Okay. So here's my um, what I want to show is a little bit of everything. Okay. Um, so let me start actually with the uh, EKS demo. Okay and. Uh, Keeping my fingers crossed, you know, live demos are always very interesting, and especially when I'm connected to a network called uh, a slow network, scale public slow. <laughs> okay, because my scale public fast did not work. <laughs> so, so talk about, you know, anyway. Um, all right, so, so let's go into my instances. Okay, and, oh, come on. Okay, so there, here are my instances. I have my copilot, my controller, and all that, which I'll get to in a second. But we're still looking at the EKS demo where I did the manual um, injection of seeds myself, okay? So I'm gonna try to connect to it. Remember what this is doing? This is the Bastion host, right? And I'm connecting to the Bastion host, okay? That's all I'm doing, right? So let me connect to that. Okay, and I'm, and I'm good to go, okay? So now I am going to do a few things. Hmm. All right. Okay. So let's let's look at, you know, kind of uh, the uh, huh. 
I'm blanking out for a second here uh, on the cube kernel <laughs> commands. Um, so let's let's do get context. That'll get me going. Okay. So the, here are the two contexts. Okay. Um, one is one. Uh, other one is two. <laughs> Very. You know, rags ns fed to one and fed to two. Okay. So let me set the context or use context, whatever that is, right? Is it set context? Use context. I can never figure that out. Okay, and just to make sure, get context. Okay, that's good. Okay, so now let's get the nodes. And you'll see here, this is running 172.21. Okay, this is the US that I was talking about, which is basically running in Dublin or whatever, whatever the case may be, okay? Now, if I do the same thing with uh, two, you should be able to see that as 22, okay? And, uh, you know, all of this is automatically done for me um, through uh, EKS CubeFed, which is really cool, right? Um, so let's look at some pods. Okay, and it doesn't really matter which cluster. Okay, I can take a look at all of this, right? And you'll see here, you have the, you know, kind of like the Grafana, uh, you have Prometheus, right? Um, you have the Reaper operator, um, and you have uh, basically all of this done using the CAS operator, right? Um, and, and, and pretty straightforward. Um, then you have a bunch of CRDs and all that, which, which we'll take a look into in a, in a second. You'll see here there are a number of different racks, right? Rack one, rack two, and rack three. Okay, and how I was able to set that up was, uh, you know, let's take a look at EKS West uh, or DC West. Okay, and you'll see here I injected the seeds from the central, okay, which was the other install. Right, and then what I did was I also specified the racks, and you can provide the affinity. So basically, I'm saying that you know uh, the one node is running on US West one A, the other one is on one B, and the other one is on one C. Okay, so basically, it's a three availability zone cluster. Okay, uh, and 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 that's pretty much uh, how I set this all up. Okay, um, for those of you who are Cassandra admins. Um, and, and still don't believe that this is a multi-node cluster, right? Or multi-cluster Cassandra, okay? You can run something called as node tool, okay? And basically what this is saying is, I'm running the, um, um, you know, basically the Cassandra uh, container, and I'm running the node tool utility within that, okay? And I'm providing the uh, username and password, um, you know, don't ever use, <laughs> you know, admin and password like I do, but, uh, but this is just for illustration purposes, right? So, so you will see here that I have a two data centers, DC1 and DC2, okay? Can everybody see that, right? And you can see here this is running on 21, okay? U stands for up and D stands for, I mean, N stands for normal, okay? So basically what it's doing is it's up and it's normal, okay? And you'll see here that it's running on 172.21, 172.22, and if you, if you actually do the um, nodes, there's a wide, I think this should give, no. Uh, is it get topology? I forgot. But but essentially you can you can if you if you dig through or oh, describe. Let me do this. Hopefully this will. So you'll see here that it's on 1B, one 1A, one, one and 1C, one okay? Uh, and if I do the same thing with uh, 2, right? Or with 1, rather, you'll see it a little bit different, right? 
not not a whole lot, but it's running on EU West, and it's A, B, and C. Okay, so it's already rack aware, and now what we've done is we have made it region aware as well. Okay, so if something some calamity happens in the West, I can always shift to Central, and and you know the drill, right? So this is as far as the EKS cube fed experiment was concerned, right? Now I wanted to go really multi-cloud. I wanted to kind of do it on a multi-cloud, and you will see here what I've done, and this is using Lens, okay? I have three clusters here. One is on AKS, the other is on EKS, and the third one is on GKE, okay? So, so these three are actually used by the Kate Sandra operator starting on AKS, you know, I just picked one, right? And, and essentially it installs it on EKS and uh, GK, okay? But to be able to do that, I used something called as Aviatrix, okay? And, and I used this Terraform scripts. Um, and I'll point you to this um, as we go, okay? So basically it's AVX multi-cloud Kubernetes. And what it, what it does is it, it does an opinionated implementation. You just specify the names for the AWS Azure and GCP accounts, and it'll go ahead and create the you know the appropriate things that that need to happen. For example, if you look at, uh, I believe it's variables.tf, you can see here, um, you know the AWS CIDR is 10.1, the Azure. Do you want me to increase the font? Yeah, sorry about that. I forgot about that. Okay, so you can see here it's 10.1. Okay, then you can see here for Azure it's 10.2, and for GCP it's 10.3. Okay, and you'll see that you know as we as we dig into it. Um, so it does all of this, it stands it up, and then of course the nice thing is you can tear it down as well, right? So so I wanted something that I I need to be able to do, and then you know of course what I do is I uh, um, you know I, I think the README talks about this. Essentially, all that I need to do is point it to my uh, account, to the name of the controller, okay? So what we can do is we can take a look at the controller. Okay, and to go back, I'll go back to EC2 instances. Okay, go back to the instances and look at the AVX, Aviatrix controller. Okay, and I'm gonna connect to it. Uh, or actually open the address. Okay, not secure, that's fine, I don't care. Okay, and it'll give you an uh, idea of, you know, what are the accounts that I've onboarded, you know, AWS, Azure, and Google, what are the gateways, and so on and so forth. So it provides you with a nice, uh, what, I, what I want to show here is uh, multi-cloud transit, I think, or multi-cloud gateway, one of the two. I can never remember this. So if you look at the gateways, and if I just cider filter on 10, okay, then you'll be able to see AKS, EKS and GKE, okay? And you'll see that AKS is on 10.2, 10.1, and 10.3, okay? It's basically an opinionated, opinionated implementation, okay? So now that we've seen how I set it up with uh, Aviatrix, right? Now what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna go into my cluster, right? So to do that, I'll just go to Lens, which is kind of cool because I don't have to do any of the kubectl commands, right? Um, <laughs> And uh, here's my um, Azure, right? And what I'll do is I'll take a look at uh, some of the parts, okay, and take a look at the Kate Sandra operator. And you can see here, somewhere here, it should have a control plane um, of true or something. I mean, uh, a data plane is, I mean, control plane is equal to true. Uh, I can never <laughs> see that when I want to. Let me, uh, deployments, let's look at that. But, but believe me, somewhere in there, it's there. Okay, uh, let me look at overview. Uh, that's not good. But, you know, you should be able to see this. Um, I'm sure I'll, I'll be able to see that in a second. Um, actually, let's look at custom resources. And you'll see here, this is the Kate Sandra cluster that was created, okay? And the name of the Kate Sandra cluster is uh, Rags and S, okay? And you'll see here, these are the contexts 
that was injected DC GKE and DC EKS. Okay? And these are the data centers that are there. So, for example, if I go to um, EKS, let's go to EKS, right? And if I look at the pods, you should be able to see a DC. So, you can see here, this is the DC that was injected, okay? So, so it has two, um, you know, here's the DC that, that got injected into the configurations. In fact, if I go back to the Azure, which is really where I started, right? Uh, and I can take a look at the uh, look at the uh, on the client configs. You can see the you know the two clusters being injected here, right? So here's my EKS AVX cluster and my um, GKE AVX cluster. Okay, and that's kind of how I I kind of made it happen. And again, I think a lot of this was already built into Cassandra. So I didn't really have to do much other than working on the networking. You know, once I got the networking going, everything was pretty straightforward to, you know, to make it happen. And now with the Kate Sandra operator, which is really about multi-cluster, multi-cloud, and so on, makes it a lot easier um, to be able to install on, uh, on Kate Sandra. Okay? So with that, I'm almost at the end of my presentation. I view my slideshow. Let me go randomly to 30. Okay, that's good. All right, so I'm done with the demo. We saw the EKS CubeFed demo. We also saw the multi-cloud demo where I installed an e um, on, uh, actually, I probably should have shown you a little bit of the command line, uh, but I guess I'll skip it today. You know, we really don't have too much time. And with that, if you want to head over to kcentra.io, it has Pretty good docs, actually. Surprisingly, for something which is pretty technical, it's pretty straightforward to install, whether you want to install on Minikube, whether you want to install on Kind, whether you want to install on Sivo, really anywhere, you know, you can do that. Um, I myself wrote a blog about multi-region Cassandra on EKS, so you can take a look at that using KubeFed. You know, it essentially goes through the same demonstration that I did today. Um, but like I said before, we also run workshops every Wednesday. Um, you know, you're welcome to attend. Uh, I tell everybody that you know we're living in the golden age of developers, right? Um, we really, you know, we have all the power, right, as a developer. <laughs> so it's really up to us. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's really up to us to take full advantage of this, maximize our income, whatever. <laughs> uh, but but do attend this. We also provide badges. Um, and, and for whatever reason, these badges are extremely popular, <laughs> okay? Um, we also have a pretty robust discussion going on in Discord. So, you know, something a little bit more permanent, you know, in the workshop we have a lot of chatting going on, but that's primarily on YouTube. Um, but if you want something a little bit more permanent, you know, jump onto Discord and try that out. Like I said, whole bunch of these, if you are in, uh, interested in inter uh, introduction to NoSQL, or if you're inter interested in building your own TikTok clone, or if any of you are interested in doing a Swift workshop, Swift is Apple's open source, um, you know, client and server-side programming, you can try all of those, okay? So, like I said, badges extremely popular, okay? So, they look cool though, you know? Uh, so, try it out, and with that, Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Still have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Ruggs. Um, I am so happy you were here. If there are, uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions, if you are able. Absolutely. Um, are there any questions in the room? Um, oh, yeah, I'll come over. Thank you for the presentation, Rex, and uh, for the multi-cloud, multi-region deployment. So as the organization planning to go to production, do you have any advice to reduce costs as like if you're <laughs> going to one provider to other? So just should like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I jokingly refer to this as I'm a developer advocate and I really don't concern myself about costs, which is really a bad thing to say, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but maybe somebody in the audience has better, um, you know, uh, like guidance, especially from a cost perspective. Anybody wants to jump in and, and kind of provide, especially from a 
multi-cloud perspective, as I understand, right? Um, anybody wants to jump in? Otherwise, I really don't have good guidance. Uh, my apologies. No? Okay. Sorry. So the question-answer session didn't start very well, but, uh, but we'll keep going. <laughs>